Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michelle Ekstrom, and I am Education Program Director at the National Conference of State Legislatures. I welcome you today to this webinar, Protecting Student Data Privacy, What Policymakers Need to Know, sponsored by the National Conference of State Legislatures. Today, you will hear from Paige Kowalski, an education data expert, and Oklahoma State Representative Jason Nelson, who sponsored legislation last year to protect student data privacy. I want to remind you that this webinar is being recorded and archived. We will send out a link of the archive in case you'd like to revisit the event or for those of you who are not able to join us today. Our first presenter is Paige Kowalski from the Data Campaign. Paige Kowalski is Director of State Policy and Advocacy at the Data Quality Campaign. She joined DQC in 2008 to promote the essential role education data plays in making instructional, management, and policy decisions. In her current role, Paige manages DQC's efforts to support state policymakers in understanding their roles and responsibilities in supporting effective data use at all levels. She leads a team of professionals to determine DQC's data for action state survey, provide direct policy assistance to states, identify emerging issues, and connect data use to current policies and practices. Paige received her bachelor's degree in international relations from the University of California, Davis, and earned a master's degree in public policy from the George Washington University, where she focused on education policy. Today, Paige will share with us her expertise in safeguarding data to ensure effective data use. So we welcome Paige. Thanks, Michelle. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I appreciate everyone jumping on the line and taking the time to engage in this conversation. Um, for those of you that are familiar with DQC or, or less familiar, we've long believed that protecting student data is critical to the conversation um, around protecting, around effective data use. Um, but it's been more uh, prominent um, in, in all of your states, in these national conversations, and in the media. Um, as ed reform efforts enter implementation phases and new folks are entering the conversation. So I want to kick us off with some context, because context is everything, and ground the conversation in, in the goal. And the goal is really about delivering value out of data to families and educators. Um, education data isn't new, but the focus of using it for continuous improvement is. And the idea of using data to improve transparency, system performance, and most importantly, student achievement is what motivated states to begin thinking about how to better leverage student data and build state-level uh, state student data systems. But when we think about the value of those systems, uh, this is the picture I want you to have in your, in your mind about the, the point of why we're collecting this information beyond compliance reporting. We're asking our teachers to teach better, move kids faster, and personalize learning based on learner needs, and we're holding them accountable for this. When we talk about data collection, access, and use, and I know you're all talking about it in your states, this is it. This is the holy grail of education. If we start to move this conversation backwards, then this is what we stand to lose. And what you're looking at is an infographic that we developed um, around, actually, t to talk about data literacy, which we're going to kick off next month, to start to paint a picture in people's minds of what does data use look like um, for the teacher. And it goes much beyond assessment data. It's, it's much beyond um, what a state can provide. It's everything they do all day, all year long, um, with local data, with state data, um, conversations they have with parents, with the kids in their classrooms, with their peers, their principals, around how to move each child forward based on their needs. So I want to keep this picture in your head as we think about how do we do this work, how do we protect privacy, but ensure that teachers are able to do this. We can't get to that picture if we don't support effective data use by collecting the right data to answer the questions that stakeholders have, including teachers. Um, and meeting the needs of those educators and families by providing them access to that data and providing it to them in a way that makes sense so that it's in the right format and it's actionable. We also need to make sure that we get the work right to ensure that it's useful to them, and that's really all about getting feedback. How did they use it? Was it helpful? And anything less than that isn't going to get us there. At the same time, an integral part of, of effective data use is ensuring student privacy. We have to get the data right, we have to get the formats right, and ensure that it's timely. But if we're not going, if we're not protecting privacy, security, and confidentiality throughout that entire process, 
we won't build trust in the data. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with FERPA. FERPA is how we've been referring to student privacy as we've had these conversations over the years. It's been um, a foundational piece of legislation. It was passed in 1974 by Congress to ensure that student records would be kept private by limiting the disclosure of those records. But the need to protect privacy, while the need to protect privacy hasn't changed since Congress took the lead on student privacy, but the context around data and the means to protect privacy have changed. So there's been an evolution. If you look um, you know, way back, certainly when probably most of us on the line were growing up, it was very paper-based. And then we started to transition to, to uh, uh, electronic and computer, and if you remember these diskettes. And now we're having conversations where it involves things like servers and internet and cloud um, and data warehouse. So the, the, uh, our, the technology around collecting, storing, and securing data is evolving. Um, during this, at the same time, FERPA hadn't kept up with, with those changes. Um, FERPA today still limits the disclosure of student records and provides a solid foundation for student privacy, but given these changes over time, stakeholders across the spectrum have demanded clarity from the U.S. Department of Education on how to interpret the rules laid out in 1974. In 2008, under President Bush, and then in 2011, under President Obama, the department issued new regulations to clarify aspects of the law, giving the evolving landscape around data. The process by which they did that was a public regulatory process. In 2008, they helped clarify the role of the state um, with these state uh, data systems and, and what role the state could play um, acting on behalf of districts and schools. And in 2011, they added provisions uh, to strengthen FERPA, including establishing the Privacy Technical Assistance Center, a chief privacy officer at the U.S. Department of Education, and stricter penalties for, un for any unauthorized disclosure. As we think about FERPA, it's important to note that it's worked. Um, over time, we don't have any evidence of, of real incidental or even chronic failings to meet the provisions of that law, either by agencies, whether they're schools or districts or states, or um, by the service providers and contractors that work with these agencies. The law itself has been amended by Congress over time, most recently last year by Michelle Bachman to enable uh, foster care caseworkers to add to access education records. There's been a lot of conversation about whether or not the regulations in 08 and, and 11 weakened FERPA. Um, they didn't. We don't feel that it weakened FERPA. It added some protections and some um, and and strengthened it in a lot of ways. Um, but it clarified a lot of of what folks were asking the department to clarify, and it continues to be a foundation for protecting student privacy. However, it's time to start to identify the gaps in privacy and security. Uh, FERPA doesn't address security at all. Um, security wasn't an issue in 1974. It's time to address those gaps and begin to fill them. So as these data systems have come online and more folks have access, there are new people at the table having this conversation, and they have real questions around how all of this is going to work. There's been a number of concerns raised about education data. Over the past year, we've seen increasing concerns around the type of data collected, uh, who has access to this information, the role of service providers and contractors. And most folks just aren't sure who's in charge of all of this and what's going to happen if there is some sort of data breach. We've often seen some myths arise. There have been concerns um, uh, um, that are often reflect a perceived link between data collection and Common Core and the role of the federal government. These um, conversations seem to have um, seem to be dying down some. I think a lot of different folks have um, done a good job getting some facts out, and the conversation has changed a little bit. Um, there's a slide at the very end of this with some resources. There's a MythBuster document on there that will get you um, links to, that gets you both the facts, but also links to some original documents, including um, the four federal laws that prohibit the U.S. Department of Education from collecting student-level uh, PII data. Um, there are emerging concerns around the role of the assessment consortia. I'm sure a lot of you are having those conversations in your state. We encourage you to keep an eye on the PARC website and the Smarter Balanced website. Um, I think PARC just released all of their privacy policies and Smarter Balanced is, is wrapping up that process, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions there that I can. 
concerns are often reflecting some confusion and skepticism um, about the ability of the government to secure data, some confusion and skepticism around cloud. I think most folks just aren't sure exactly what it is and whether or not it's safe. So those are, are more areas that we're going to have to begin to address this year in this conversation. So beyond some of these myths, there are some real issues that I think all of you on the line have a big role in, um, in, in helping resolve for folks. When we, when we dig under the surface, uh, we start to see um, some uh, these four issues really start to emerge. Um, we haven't had the conversations with families about the value of this information. The average parent doesn't know what a high school feedback report or an early warning system is and how student-level data is critical to building those. While states are protecting privacy and keeping data secure, they haven't done a great job of communicating how they do that. So we have a real need for better communication. Um, again, our information needs and technology are evolving constantly, uh, but our state policies haven't. Privacy and security is being protected but isn't necessarily reflected in our state policies, whether it's state board or a department of education or in our legislature, and that needs to change in order to build trust with families and other local stakeholders. Um, I think we've all stumbled in our efforts a little bit to communicate about privacy and security. Um, I think a lot of us tend to rely too much on legal and technical language. Um, we use things like uh, uh, opt-out and encryption and words like FERPA and things that just don't make sense to the average person and we need to do a better job of, of finding a common language that makes sense to people. And I think this conversation and the policies become harder still when we acknowledge that privacy is a very personal issue and we all perceive it differently. My limits around privacy are different than your limits. And I think for those of you that engage in any way with Facebook, you notice there are those people who share absolutely everything and have no qualms with, with people knowing all about their lives, and there are people that are reluctant to share anything at all. So that's that's that same general sentiment that's out there um, throughout the population, and it's, it's difficult to have the conversation and meet everybody's needs and, and then create policies around that. So the reality is it's time for some changes. We've got to make changes in our policies. We've got increasing data demands. We've got constantly evolving technology. And we've got to find some new approaches for ensuring privacy. Again, it doesn't mean we haven't been protecting it. But things are starting to move very quickly in terms of use and access and technology, and it's time to catch up to that. So what changes are needed? We feel like, given the challenges I laid out earlier, we need to focus our efforts around strengthening communication and getting some better privacy policies in place. And to get more specific, ensuring that parents and educators find value in the data, they start to understand the who, what, where, when, and why around what data is collected and why are we collecting it, by what authority, who has access to it, and how are we protecting privacy. And using that same opportunity, communications opportunity, to clarify the misconceptions out there and be transparent, transparent about the privacy protections that you, that you have and that you're planning. And then lastly, and I think this is, is for all of you on this line, it really is an opportunity for state policymakers to step up and ensure that privacy, security, and governance policies meet 21st century demands for information. Um, and I, again, I have um, resources at the end that describe these three strategies and provide some examples of what we're starting to see emerge across states. Um, in, we've had a lot of conversations over the last many months with state legislators, and we know a lot of folks have looked at uh, the Oklahoma legislation that Representative Jason Nelson will talk to you in more detail about, um, Oklahoma HB 1989. Um, it's, a, it's a great foundation. Um, I believe it was passed in May of 2013. There's been some changes in the conversation, and so we've put out some guidance that if you're taking a look at that, legislation, some things you might want to think um, just to address. You know, we're learning more and more about uh, what are folks concerned about and what are some potential solutions. So, you know, we want you to take a look at ensuring that data governance is a pri primary component of any policy or legislation you put in place. And Oklahoma has a great example of this. It lays out who's responsible. It lays out the roles of, of each of the players at the state level. It lays out the process. It charges people to act, and it, it has an accountability process embedded in that. 
thinking about broadening it beyond K-12, these same conversations are happening in early childhood, in, um, in higher education, in workforce, and they happen at those linkage points. Um, there's been a lot of concern when people hear we're linking the data, P-20, what does that really mean, and who's in charge of those decisions? So I'd encourage you, I've, I've put in a couple of bills here, um, they're linked um, to some work that Maryland and Kentucky have done around that. Thinking of ways to support your schools and districts, all of the challenges that you're having at the state level are also being felt in all of your schools and districts. They need privacy training for anybody who has a role in protecting privacy, which is pretty, buddy, pretty much everybody at, at the school and district level. Um, and they also need, they need good privacy and security policies for their district data systems. And most districts don't have um, good legal and technical um, expertise on staff to help them navigate that. So I think there's a, a real role for states. Um, and the New York legislation that's, that uh, was just introduced a bit ago gets to some of this, uh, directing the state to, to draft some um, model privacy and security policies <coughs> Excuse me, that uh, districts could adopt or go develop their own. I think another concern is, you know, your state and you have 400 districts, if you just, you know, direct all your districts to draft and adopt, you essentially have 400 standards of privacy, of student privacy across your state. So ideally, they can, there can be a high, one high standard and help everybody get there. Thinking about establishing a chief privacy officer, um, Tennessee just introduced a bill similar to Oklahoma and added the chief privacy officer. Um, the New York legislation has that as well. Most uh, organizations that, um, that are charged with collecting data and providing access to data, um, they, they need to be good stewards of that data, and that's a critical role to ensure, um, to ensure that you're meeting those needs. And then thinking about civil penalties um, for unauthorized uh, data access and for breaches, um, again, New York started to lay this out. So I would, I would take a look at what you've already got on the books and maybe there's some gaps. And again, at the end of the day, at any time you're thinking about protecting students, you want to think about we need transparency in the system, we need governance, people have to be, we have to put people in charge of this and, hold, and then we have to hold them accountable. So you want to make sure you hit those three things all along the way. Um, as I mentioned, I have some resources here at the end. Um, everything we've done is on our website as well. Um, but here are just some links to some key things that we use that will help you, um, both on communicating the value of data, why data matters, why are we collecting this, and why do we think providing access is important. Um, debunking some of those data myths, taking op communications opportunity to make sure that you're having a conversation based on facts. And then some resources around how can we better protect how can we better tech, protect data um, and and help keep student data private um, in the 21st century. So that wraps it up for me. I have my contact information on here um, for you. We are happy to uh, I'm happy to take questions now, but please feel free to contact me at any time offline um, or any member of the DQC staff. We're happy to talk about. Um, you know, our recommendations or any materials we have in the works on this. And thank you all. I appreciate your time. Great. Thank you so much, Paige. I just want to remind everyone that I know that you may have a lot of specific questions about this issue um, that perhaps may not have been addressed in Paige's presentation. So feel free to um, enter those into the chat box. I'll be reading them and asking Paige and Representative Nelson to respond to those at the end of the webinar. I also wanted to uh, remind everyone that this is being archived, and both the archive and the PowerPoint presentation will be available next week on NCSL's website, and I'll be sending out a link to everyone so that they can access that easily. So our next presenter is Oklahoma Representative Jason Nelson. Representative Nelson represents District 87 in Oklahoma City. He has served in the House since 2008 and currently chairs the Appropriations and Budget Human Services Committee and serves on the Appropriations and Budget, Common Education, Human Services, and Calendar Committees. Representative Nelson is a leader in the areas of education and human services reform. In 2011, Representative Nelson led a four-member Department of Human Services working group in a comprehensive review of the state's child welfare system. 
During the 2012 legislative session, this working group proposed a sweeping reform that became law, including passage of State Question 765 by Oklahoma voters. In 2010, he led the successful bipartisan effort to pass the Lindsay Nicole Henry Scholarships for Students with Disabilities Program Act. The school choice law allows special needs students to take a portion of the state money set aside for their education with them to a qualified private school of choice. This law is the first of its kind passed in Oklahoma. So today we welcome Representative Nelson. He's going to talk a bit about his legislation, House Bill 1989, and he's going to uh, talk a little bit about why this issue was important to them in Oklahoma and why they decided on this legislative approach. Welcome, Representative Nelson. Thanks, Michelle. And following Paige makes me feel wholly inadequate, so I'll let what she uh, said uh, stand for me in terms of, of uh, hitting the high points of transparency and the governance part, and that's really what we did in 1989. It came about, uh, we have several very active parent groups um, that have just kind of cropped up organically over the last few years, and one of the big issues they kept uh, asking legislators about was uh, was student data, and, and uh, you've got everything uh, ranging from, you know, just general questions to, uh, you know, conspiracy theories. And you know, as a parent who has two children in public school, it's something that uh, I'm concerned about. And so we began to ask questions and realized that everything that Oklahoma was doing related to uh, the collection, use, storage, uh, sharing of student data was really done at a staff level uh, off the radar. Uh, you know, as a legislator, we're interested in the budget, where the money's going, how it's being spent. Uh, the results of that, um, the curriculum that's being used, the standards that are being set, but really nobody had ever bothered to look at, at something as, as important as the data to make sure that we were collecting what we needed or that um, we weren't collecting things we didn't need and how was the information being used. And, and um, so it was a little bit of a, I'll try to say it delicately, a balancing act between uh, a lot of the folks that had a concern about the collection and use of student data and working with the Department uh, of Education here, uh, getting into the details. And uh, I now know why this had not been addressed before. Uh, it's complex, um, and it, it really consumes a lot of time. But we decided, because of that, to take a measured approach and start with at least what do we have, what data is being collected, who's responsible for it, uh, and and the first step was to make it transparent. Let's do a public inventory with the definitions of, of all of those uh, data points that are being collected, publish that on the state's uh, Department of Ed website, and then have our State Board of Education, which is appointed by the governor, uh, set the policies and procedures uh, related to the use and collection of that data that had never been done. So now the public can just easily go on the Department of Ed's website, see what's being collected, and if they have some concerns, they can go to the State Board of Education. Nothing like that existed before. Uh, we left you know, a lot of things unanswered because we were uh, really just starting out. Uh, we have plans this year to come back uh, and start to answer more of the why questions. Why do we collect this? Uh, what's a legitimate uh, reason to collect uh, student data? Uh, who should have it? Uh, a lot of people are concerned. Um, you know, the parental uh, income information is collected at the school site level for school nutrition uh, reasons. Should that information go beyond the local school site? Uh, if so, under what circumstances uh, parents consented to provide that information to the school. It's not collected surreptitiously, but, but so what's appropriate at a school site level, what's appropriate at the state level, and then what of that information could be passed on to, to the federal government or to universities for research or to private entities. And so we're really quickly moving from the Student Data Act, which really is an inventory and a, and a policy setting uh, document into the philosophical area of the use and collection of data. It would be okay for this local school site to have 
medical information uh, under certain circumstances. The parents consent to give that to the school because of a medical uh, need of, uh, in relationship to their child. Same with uh, income information, those kinds of things. I'm not so sure that the state needs to have that. Uh, right now, the state accreditation officers go out and make sure all that stuff's in place uh, in terms of parents' income that the school districts aren't drawing money. They shouldn't through uh, federal programs or state programs. But that's, you know, more of the the philosophical question, what is in bounds and what's out of bounds. And that's what we're, we're finding out is is even more tedious than what we started with. And so we're kind of grateful that what little bit we did last year is inspiring a conversation nationally that we can hopefully learn from other states how they're going to address some of these problems. And the chief privacy officer is is one of those ideas that, that we're looking at. Um, we've got um, kind of sketched out a general philosophy that to, to the extent that specific data is collected on a student and used for that student, uh, to further their academic goals, we're fine with that. But the moment individual students' information is used to further somebody else's goals, whether it's the administration's goals or state budget writers' goals to say, well, these kids uh, you know, are from a demographic that doesn't typically succeed at a very high level, we might want to move resources somewhere else where it makes more sense, where it's a better investment. So we're looking at prohibiting uh, the use of data for those purposes. Uh, so if it benefits the student directly, they're driving those decisions, we're fine with using the data there, but we're looking at specifically prohibiting the use of it to to you know potentially limit resources uh, to certain groups of students prospectively. And that, as you can imagine, gets in a political context pretty complex pretty fast. Uh, we're also going to be looking more at the data vendors uh, requiring local encryption. Uh, the work we did on DHS, I think their state database is pretty secure. What we were having problems with were, you know, a laptop being stolen out of a car that had data on it. So we're we're going to also be looking uh, specifically at what school districts do with their data, how they secure it, is it encrypted. We've already had some conversations with some vendors that serve the school districts. Uh, and that work with also the Department of Education to make sure that the databases talk. So it's the more we've started working on it, the more complex it gets. Uh, but but Representative David Brumbaugh, who's from the Tulsa area, uh, and me and, and Representative Jason Murphy uh, are still just slowly working our way through this. And I don't want to ramble anymore, but I'd be happy to answer any questions about specifics of the law that we passed um, and what we're looking at. I'd look forward to hearing any suggestions that other people have about how to proceed. Thank you. And just as a reminder, you can feel free to uh, type your questions into the chat box, and I will be happy to read those to our presenters. So I actually have gathered a few questions that I have for both of you. Um, first of all, Representative, I mean, you had mentioned several times that this is difficult work, and um, politically it's difficult, technically it's difficult. And I was just wondering if you could give advice to your fellow colleagues and to legislative staff who are on the uh, webinar, who may be listening in later, um, who are either concerned about this issue or maybe working on legislation in their state. Well, I think one thing that would have helped would have been to Began talking to vendors earlier. Uh, what happens is you get we we had a tendency to get focused on something uh, narrow. Uh, for instance, we had a conversation with a number of people. Our state superintendent, uh, me. There was a lot of us that said, "Well, there's no reason for a school to be collecting social security numbers, especially for uh, student identification purposes." The Social Security Administration advises against that anyway. But then you come to find out, well, there's parents do provide that information for for legitimate purposes and, and that information is kept at the at the local level. So it's the advice that I would have would be just to have some initial conversations with some vendors, uh, local school districts, uh, as well as not in addition to the State Department of Ed, to, to sketch out the lay of the land. I mean, we just started focusing first on 
state data in isolation. And it, we spent a lot of time, you know, working on something to realize that we kind of had to go back to the beginning uh, and rethink our approach. I mean, it seemed reasonable at the time, but and the, the best example is the the one on Social Security. We spent a lot of time on that to realize that, you know, you can't really just do a blanket prohibition of that, as convenient as that would be. Paige, do you do you have anything that you want to add? Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, you know, I really want to emphasize the point that the representative made about how tedious and complex this work can be. And I say that um, not to discourage you from undertaking it, but to to do it in a very thoughtful way. The, the, again, I, this blanket prohibition, I've seen that pop up in some draft legislation, and it's, it's well-intentioned behind it, but then you dig into the weeds of how schools and districts actually operate, and it just gets so much harder. And I would encourage my, my two recommendations to get yourself um, to, and onto some firm ground and, and not sort of uh, dread this idea of how tedious these conversations can be is, again, focus your conversation around governance. Rather than thinking about pro, uh, prohibiting a lot of things or outlining what can be collected or, or can't or shouldn't, make sure that, you have a str that, that what you're doing is setting up policies that establish a strong framework for how those decisions will be made as they come. Because whatever you decide to do in this legislative session, there's probably things, um, just like the representative mentioned, when you dive in deeper, you uncover something else. You've peeled that onion back, and you don't want to accidentally sort of legislate yourself into a, into a box. But if you have a strong framework where it's very transparent and very clear who's being charged with the work and that there's an accountability process in place for those decisions, um, you, you can tackle those decisions as they come. And, uh, and, and I would encourage you all at the same time to start with the questions you're trying to answer because you'll find that um, there are reasons why certain data is collected. And, and if, if um, you know, our minds automatically go to, well, we'd never have a need for this data, but if you authorize a program down the road um, to, to, to mitigate some risk out there, you're going to need to know if that program worked. You're going to need to know, should I scale this up? Should I fund this another year? And it could be that you need a data point um, in order to do that. And maybe it's a health or a wellness data point. It could be an income data point, whatever it is that you're currently squeamish about collecting. But down the road, given new research or new practices happening in, happening in districts, you may need that data point. The point is to have a strong governance framework and accountability framework so that you can have those conversations in the daylight, make sure the right people are having the conversations and asking the questions and making the decisions, and then hold those folks accountable for the decisions they make. And I'll, I'll give a, another example. We, we require the State Board of Education to, to approve uh, sharing of data with, with just about anybody. And it wasn't, I mean, the ink from the governor's signature wasn't dry, and I had a phone call from uh, a constituent with a question about her child's case. I needed to talk to the State Department of Ed and was unable to do that until the board acted uh, to allow legislators to work with their constituents to get questions answered. So there was we all had a big laugh about the irony of that. But uh, those are the kinds of things that it, it, you know, there was a delay there, but there was at least a transparent process uh, to approach that, uh, so I think that gave people comfort, even though we had to wait and and uh, allow the board to act on that. But everybody knew that, you know, everybody would know now that this was happening um, in a transparent way. Do I um, have a couple other questions? I have one that came in to me before the webinar even began um, from a legislative staffer who was wondering if the concerns rose in your state that the legislation may impede state performance auditors' ability to do their work. Um, apparently this is coming up in another state and they're wondering if that came up and if so, how you address those concerns. Uh, I'm thumbing through the bill here. I think there is a, a, a provision in here that allows for that. 
And we made it clear with the people that were concerned about student data collection and use and, and uh, privacy that we were going to be working with, and this was a group, uh, several of these groups were, you know, I'll say suspicious, uh, but we just said we have to do this and we've got, uh, I know we have a provision in here that allows for that. Um, and one of the things I did say at the beginning of the session when I agreed to help run the legislation was that I was not going to push anything that would jeopardize federal funding. And the reason was real practical for that because we're, you know, we have a strap budget here and anything that would have cost us any federal funding for education would not have seen the light of day. So we were very careful about that and that was a, a, one of the things that we specifically considered. I have another question from someone from the audience. Uh, does the legislation in Oklahoma differentiate between blanket prohibition for some data versus prohibition on certain data unless it is with parent or student consent? See, that's a great question. Um, we, that's something actually we're going to address uh, this time where there, there was several people that were pushing us to say, well, we just want to be an opt-in state. And I would say, well, what do you mean by that? And they'd say, well, you have to opt in to, you know, have any of your students' data collected. And I said, so you just drop your kid off as anonymous. The school numbers them as they come in the door. They don't know who you are or where the kid goes at the end of the day. By virtue of enrolling your child in the public school, you're consenting, obviously, to some information. You need to know the child's directory information, uh, what, how old they are, those kinds of things. So I've, we've, it was a, kind of a process of educating some of the people that had these concerns that we need to do exactly what you're talking about, differentiating between what is normal information that the school is going to have. The, you know, the, the local school is going to know about discipline. They're going to know about the grades, the uh, who the kids' teachers are, you know, all these kinds of things. Now, how much of that then is automatic? What should the school district do if they want to collect information beyond that, or it's given to them by a parent, where the parent thinks that information only goes to the will only be used by the local school district? If it goes beyond that, there should be an additional notice, and that's the type of thing we're looking at this year. Is the is saying okay at the local level, this is fine this information is not without parental consent, and there has to be notice if that information goes further than the district. And then the same set of questions at the state level. Um, but it's, I think a lot of people, well, they, uh, a lot of people do think that all of the student-specific information collected at the local district level, since the, the database has to talk in the same language as the, our state system, that all that information is just forwarded to the federal government, which is not true. Um, could it be done? Yes. I mean, if, if, if when your database is set up that way, but that's simply not the type of reporting we're doing to the federal government. So there's also an education process there that we're not really we're not sending student-specific information to the federal government. But that's something that will, as Paige was talking about, where you want to set kind of general frameworks. That's that's part of that framework we're going to have to build this uh, this session. Paige, do you want to address, re, uh, I know that you mentioned it a little bit, but address again um, the interaction between school district data, state data, and what can be reported up at the federal level? Right. So, you know, most, and I, I wish I had a number, but I, but I am guessing it is about 99% of all data that's collected about kids in our education system is mandated by either state or federal law. Um, so while I do believe it's important to have in policy or in legislation in some way uh, a transparent process around establishing, you know, new collections or identifying what's collected, the reality at the end of the day is, is it is our, our, our lawmakers around the country that are dictating um, these collections. They're not happening. There's not a state school chief or a, or a assessment person that kind of sits around and says, I'm, gonna, I, I'm interested in this, and they go collect it um, for a whole lot of reasons. And, and probably the most important is data collection is very expensive. Um, so it doesn't just happen overnight. Um, but, you know, as the representative mentioned, you know, schools collect a, a set of data about kids when they enroll. And, and then when they enroll in programs beyond that, 
um, that they need in order to, to do the business of the school, that data goes up to the district level and is kept in a district data ses, uh, system, which then has information, you know, it's used for school bus routes and delivering uh, lunches and other kinds of IEP and special ed services, um, programmatic uh, things, aftercare, what have you. Um, districts generally uh, can't, don't have the capacity to maintain that data over time. So most districts dump their data at the end of the year. Um, it's not archived anywhere. There are paper archives in places, um, but they don't have it, records going back over time, and, and they don't have the resources to build a longitudinal data system. Um, districts have always sent, uh, historically have sent aggregate student data up to their state. So the state would say, each district, you need to tell me the percent of your kids that enrolled in each school and the percent of each of the kids that graduated high school. Well, the problem with that is we don't have good data because districts are defining everything different. The high school graduation rate in Montgomery County, California, maybe, or Montgomery County, Maryland, may be a different formula than Prince George's County, Maryland. So they started to collect student-level data at the state. And then they can put a uniform calculation over it and be able to see if kids are moving out of one county school system and into another, from one district to another, which gets you a more accurate grad rate because now you have a more accurate dropout rate. Just because you've left one district doesn't mean you dropped out. The state can actually see that the, kid, the child just moved one district over and enrolled and graduated. So we get higher quality data when we do that. As states built these systems, they were still reporting the same aggregate counts and percentages to the federal government that they always had. The difference was the states had access to a limited set of that student level data that districts were collecting. States are able to link it over time, so it's linked longitudinally. Um, and they can also, they have the ability to link to post-secondary so that we can follow kids into post-secondary or into the workforce and be able to provide feedback loops to high schools. Um, about the success of their, their programming and, and help them help principals understand um, what they might need to tw tweak in curriculum and instruction. Um, so there, there's a lot going on, and, and I think one of the most important things is really to just to identify what is each of these actors best positioned to do, and, and then what is the data that we need to collect at each level, and what needs to be reported back down the system so that folks at all of those levels can make the best decisions um, that they need to for kids. And again, it all comes down to governance and accountability and transparency. And I will add to that what Paige was saying, that when you talk about linking you know, employment data out of post-secondary education to post-secondary education to the K-12 education, uh, people get very concerned. One of the things we're looking at doing, uh, I guess maybe this is more on the academic side, but is really setting up a robust uh, uh, institutional review board process uh, in a respect that when, as this data is shared. And for instance, a group came in uh, worried about why they want to collect employment data. And I said, well, you know, our state's career tech system where juniors and seniors in high school can spend half a day learning a trade it's, that's a lot of money. We might want to know if they actually went to work in that field or they just got a half day off of high school. And so that would be, I think, a legitimate use of that, but then setting the parameters around that. So part of it is, an, from a policymaker's point of view, there's a lot of education that also has to happen with this complex set of issues uh, because there's the, the I, I would be the same way uh, but you hear something like what Paige was saying, and immediately you're you're concerned about it. And so the policymakers have to be in a place to bridge the gap between the the technical complexities and the real practical, obvious need for some of this information. And part of the way we're hoping to do that's with something like an institutional review board. That uh, is, we have home visit programs to our health department for uh, prenatal and postnatal uh, help for uh, new mothers. You know, there's talk about do we hook that up with uh, our preschool programs and things like that, and that just it, it presents real concerns. But you can also see the value of sharing that data. We've so there's a lot of other links that start to happen too. Just 
it's not just limited uh, to what's happening in the school, and that's uh, why I think what Paige is saying about setting the framework is so important. Set the framework here, and then you may have to start extending that out to how data about children collected through home visit programs to health departments uh, or, or post-secondary uh, work uh, information is included, and how it's also kept separate uh, as needed. Great. We have a couple more questions that have come in. Um, how can legislation balance the school level individual student data dashboards being piloted in districts in some states, for example, Arizona, which will help teachers tailor instruction to student needs with privacy concerns at the district, state, and federal level? Yeah, I mean, and I think either, either one of you could answer this, or both. Well, I, I, uh, yes, I mean, it's that. The answer is that's always going to be there. Um, part of it is, is and it, there's a friend of mine that I know that's a teacher, and she is worried about the data collection and who gets it, but at the same time she wants the information uh, that she can tailor the education she gives the kids in her class. So I think that there's always going to be a tension there, uh, and I think that's where the transparency part comes in so that the public can can monitor where that balance is being struck. But I, I just think that's kind of one of those, you know, perpetual problems. Yeah, Michelle, I would add and say, you know, the graphic that I showed was in my very first slide. Um, and why, and this is exactly why we created it. It's available on our website, and we actually have a video coming out um, with that same graphic. Is It's this helpful grounding image of, we need to protect privacy, but we want to sure, ensure that we can do this. And, and when you set up the framework to ensure that the this happens and that you're holding people accountable um, and that it's very transparent and very clearly communicated to people, as the representative said, there's a lot of education to be done here. This is what we're collecting and this is why. Um, and this is who has access. We need teachers and parents to have access to this information at the student level. The teacher needs to see her student's data. Parents need information on their kids. And I would encourage you to look at the student data backpack legislation in Utah um, as well, because these are the times of legislation that provide a real service to the people who are most nervous about these collections um, and, and the privacy protections in place, which are, which are teachers and parents. And when you're providing real value to teachers, the, the first person a parent goes to to have these conversations is their child's teacher. So if a teacher is getting benef a benefit out of, out of it, they can, they're, they're armed, they're empowered to have a conversation to say, well, my district and my state are collecting a set of, limited set of information about each of the kids in this school, and here's how I'm using it to tailor learning for your child. Here's how it can inform the conversation I have with you about how your child is doing. Here's the conversations I'm having with my colleagues to make sure that when your son goes over to art class, that I can have a conversation with the art teacher about this child's strengths and weaknesses. Now, again, when I have that conversation, that raises alarm bells to people. Well, why are the teachers talking about, I've legitimately heard this more and more and more. Well, I don't want the, the teachers to compare because what if the teacher turns the other teachers against my child based on something. And I think at the end of the day, we have to assume good intentions from our teachers. I think we have to empower them with data, but I think we have to hold them accountable for the decisions they make with the data in the same way that we want to hold everybody else accountable with the decisions they make with data. So I, again, bring this, we talk about balancing privacy and effective data use, it's transparency, governance, and accountability. We have another question. Uh, what qualifies the scope of data that the Oklahoma legislation includes? For example, is it all data collected by the Department of Education, which may include special ed data or disability determination services or vocational rehab? These subgroups of children may require um, much more intrusive data than is needed for the general population of students. So did the Oklahoma legislation focus on specific collection or on all data? It's on all data. And the policies that the board would set could d differentiate. Uh, but it, um, so, so we did not draw any distinction. Again, because we started 
figuring out pretty quickly that when you start doing that, it gets really complex really quickly. And we just made it clear that this is the first step in at least, you know, probably a three-step, if not a 20-step process of refining um, how we uh, gather, use, and share, and store student data. Because then there, there's a, you can just get into the whole issue of just securing the data from from uh, leaks and breaches and things like that. Then uh, the intention behind the use of the data, what was just talked about. Uh, and what I told people when they would say, well, if the teacher's going to use it to turn other teachers or something like that against my child, or they were going to use it to limit uh, the opportunities my child might have because of uh, they're kind of uh, tracking the child going forward, what I told them is that that's, that's always been an issue. Uh, you, you have to guard against that uh, anyway, but we did not want to make uh, any kind of distinction just because of the, the potential for problems um, once we started to implement the law. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we're monitoring, um, taking a look at what states are introducing in this section and uh, in the session we know a lot of states will look at different ways um, to protect student data. I have seen a couple of bills pop up um, that prohibit predictive analytics, um, which is discouraging. Um, not only would it rule out value-added measures, so I would encourage you all to just be thinking about that because I, I could see a state doing that and they also have a value-added model for their teacher evaluation, but to be thinking about, you know, you're not only limiting yourself on value-added and, and on early warning systems that may or may not even have been built yet, but any type of future um, use of that kind of, of analysis. And, you know, again, it's sort of like um, if somebody had come to you 10 years ago and explained the iPhone to you, you, would, you wouldn't really care, right, because you don't really get it. But now that we have it, we can't do without it. And I think that's kind of where we are with predictive analytics. It's new for so many of us, and it's difficult to understand, but we're starting to see some real value. But there is worry out, out there about how it could be used. And so what I would say, again, is put that framework around the, that decision-making and hold people accountable for the decisions they make. But the, the action shouldn't be, well, we'll assume everybody will do something bad with it, so we won't do it at all. Right. It should be, well, let's do it and then help people understand what it is and how to use it, train them to use it, help them understand how to use it ethically and appropriately, and then hold them accountable. Well, the same data that's used to help anticipate where your child may have challenges and to, to address those up front is the same data that could be used to do something that we wouldn't desire. So, that, again, that's the tension that's always going to, be there, and parents are going to have to be engaged. School boards are going to have to pay attention to this. State boards of eds are going to have to pay attention, and and work within the framework that that lawmakers set. A couple more questions. Um, I we you briefly mentioned Paige Park and Smarter Balanced, and I have been getting a lot of questions, a lot of concerns uh, from legislators about how the data, the assessment data, can and can't be used. Um, will that data that they are, um, that they have access to because they're scoring the assessments, how will that be used? Is there data protection built in? Um, and I know that you mentioned that both Park and Smarter Balanced are working on these privacy issues. Can you elaborate just a little bit on what you know about that? Yeah, and we do have a resource coming out soon that will, because we get a lot of these same questions too, and, and I do encourage you all to engage if you belong to one or both of the assessment consortia. And quite frankly, if, if you don't belong to either, you should be having the exact same conversation with whoever your assessment vendor is anyway, because that's basically what their role is, right? They, they You have a contract with your assessment vendor, regardless of who it is, and they provide a test, they assess kids, they score the test, they have the data at the student level, um, and oftentimes they prepare reports that go right onto your state website. Um, states own this assessment data. Uh, states are paying for these assessments and have the right to make all of the decisions about what data the consortia or their assessment, again, if you have Pearson or ACT or, or, or whoever, um, that is your contract and you are the owner, and the, the responsibility for what you share and for what reason 
and then what that vendor can do with it is under your purview. And once, um, once you engage with them in that way, that contractor, again, whether it's PARC or ACT or Pearson, they are under FERPA. And FERPA says they cannot then redisclose anything they've got. Um, you know, they, they, they are bound by you, they are bound to you by your contract, they are bound to you by any other state law that you may have in place with civil penalties or breach. They are also bound by FERPA. So the privacy policy I know that PARC put out, I encourage you all to take a look at. It's incredibly thorough and well-written. Um, it gets to both privacy uh, and security. Um, they talk about how they're going to do all of this and what the roles are, both of, of the governing states and the participating states of the, of the PARC staff, of the PARC board, um, and how they're going to um, treat that data. And again, everything will be solely at the discretion of what the state wants. There is no federal requirement whatsoever about what happens in that relationship between the state and the assessment vendor or consortia, whoever. Um, so I, I encourage you to dig in a little bit more in that, but remember they are, they are your contractor. They work for you and, and you govern that. And the Oklahoma law has a provision in there that requires the state board to set uh, expectations, including penalties, with uh, people that they have contracts with that have student data, have the state student data. I um, also want to mention that we are planning a webinar for either late February or early March with both PARC and Smarter Balance to provide an update to you on where they're at in the development and rollout of their assessments, but also to answer your privacy concerns as well. So for those of you who are from PARC or Smarter Balance states and planning to implement their assessments uh, next year, um, we encourage you to participate in that webinar as well. You'll receive notice about that here probably in the next week or so. So with that, um, our time has come to an end, and I really want to thank both of our speakers, Paige Kowalski from the Data Quality Campaign and Representative Jason Nelson from Oklahoma. I encourage you to either email me or Paige or Representative Nelson if you have any additional questions. And I also want to remind you that here at NCSL, we um, always are happy to answer any of your questions, provide research to you. We also have the ability to come to your state um, and provide testimony to you or just sit with you and your colleagues to work through these issues. And we can bring along experts such as Paige or others as well. So I encourage you to reach out if you need that assistance. Thank you. and. Um, our webinar is concluded.